All right, my friends, we are back with Anthony Gramani, and today we are going to be talking about bass. Bass. Yeah, not just bass fishing, right? Nope. No, it's bass. It's bass. It's the low end. It's the stuff that really gets you moving. Um, you know, Gene, in, in, I, I talk about psychoacoustics, right? And I talked about the fact that my goal in life is to become a professional psychoacoustician so I can go to parties and talk about the fact that I'm a psychoacoustician, which sounds like you're kind of psycho. But there is a field of study called psychoacoustics, which is the study of how your brain interprets what goes into your eardrums and into your brain. Um, and in the field of psychoacoustics, it's actually known that a, something like 30 or 40 percent of your perception of quality of sound comes from the bottom two octaves. So there's about 10 octaves we hear. And two of those contribute to 40 percent of what makes people go, wow, that sounds really good or not good. So from like 20 hertz, let's say 20 hertz to about 80 or 100 hertz dominates the sensation of quality. You got to get it right. And um, so you got to get it right. However, small rooms that we work in, rooms between, you know, 16 feet and 30 feet have a lot of problems with bass uh, caused by standing waves and other issues. And so one of the things that's the most important to get right is actually the hardest to get right in the listening rooms and home cinemas we work in. So that's why we're going to spend an hour yakking about this. Yeah. And one thing I want to get straight up ahead with you is I notice there's several acoustic companies or acoustic experts and the, the people that sell you the fuzz and they sell you the bass treatments and the, and the different room products. There's still many of them that are kind of behind the times in science and they just want to sell you a bunch of bass traps, but they don't believe in the benefits of multi-sub. Yeah. And I want to get the air clear with you right now. Do you believe in the science of multi-sub? Do I believe? So <laughs> for the record, I sell bass traps. So, so you would think I want to sell more bass traps. No, I believe in the science of multi-subs. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is I've been messing around with multi with subwoofers for, I don't know, 30, 30 years now and noticed how challenging it is to get good bass, not actually just out of subwoofers, but full range speakers. A subwoofer is just a full range speaker that's playing nothing above 100 hertz or something. Just think of mm -hmm. it that way. Um, and I've noticed how often you put a speaker in a room or a subwoofer in a room and its response is absolutely horrid. It's just like completely broken. You move the subwoofer around a few feet, suddenly you get all the bass back and then you move it again and it's all gone. Or you change your seats around a little bit and the, the bass comes in and goes. So I've been worrying about this for a long time since it's such an important part of the sound quality. And um, and I you know realized a long time ago that correct placement of the subwoofer or multiplying into two subwoofers or three subwoofers or four subwoofers helps the issue. Um, so I've been playing with that a lot. Now, uh, and I, I bring him up a lot. There's a guy who got his doctorate in subwoofer. I call him Dr. Subwoofer, a call, guy called Todd Welty, mm -hmm. uh, who comes to us from the National Research Council, from the, uh, the Acoustics Department of the National Research Council, and who studied this and figured out, okay, well, so we know that Base is sensitive to placement. What do we do? And he just, he actually got his doctorate thesis, doctoral thesis in this. And so uh, wrote some really good papers, actually, that you can read. Just download it. Look at his name, Todd Welty, and, you know, enter Todd Welty subwoofers, and you can read many papers uh, from him. Um, and he just kind of figured out the math behind it, what actually happens, and came up, most important, he came up with some really cool, simple recipes for, you know, just add a little subwoofer here, a little egg over here, a little pepper, um, a little sugar, and you get, and voila, like they say at the Cordon Bleu School, you get beautiful bass. Um, and the bottom line is one subwoofer is, or one speaker, one subwoofer, it's really hard to get really good and consistent bass, like at multiple seats, and you give it where your, your seats. Two subwoofers, it's a lot better. Four subwoofers, it's really good. More than four, five, six doesn't really help much more. That you know, the, a, a good um, sweet spot is four subwoofers correctly located in a room. And if you read his papers and his recommendations, you'll see a few recipes that work well. Either four in the four corners, or four at the twenty-five percent points or midpoints in the room. There's benefits. Yeah, yeah. Minute. We have a bunch of we have a bunch of articles on that. And years ago, I remember when the when the multi sub stuff came out, uh, they were really like THX was promoting four mid wall subs. I never liked the four mid-wall sub approach because you don't get a really good low frequency coupling factor as you do when you put them in the corners. You yeah. lose a little bit seat to seat consistency when you go to each corner, but you have so much more low frequency coupling factor. So you can use smaller subs and they act like a bigger sub because they still give you that co-located additive benefit at the very low frequencies below yeah. like 30 Hertz. Yeah. And then we've got EQ 
to kind of fix everything else at that mm -hmm. point because now your c to c consistency is worthy enough of an eq actually doing meaningful work yeah. and what's cool about that what you just said gene is that's exactly what todd welty predicted um so his recipes are you know all these different versions and he quantifies them based on coupling or gain from the room um seat to seat smoothness there, there's sort of three um let's see three criteria there's more than that but the three main ones that he talks about is is how smooth is the base at the main seats how much variation is there from seat to seat and how much coupling do you get between the subwoofer and the room and based on those goes well this this solution has good grades here and there it's I mean, read the paper it's really well done yeah and interestingly enough the the best the one that has the best grades overall is actually impractical, which is four subwoofers, 25% in from the corners of the rooms. And I've done that a number of times by just hanging them from the ceiling. It works really well. Oh, that's a good, not, that's a good idea actually. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. It's not super practical always, but it, it works. And then the next one in terms of grades is that, that midpoint in the room, but he, it is clearly in the paper that's like, well, you're not going to get a lot of coupling. And then after that is the four corners, it just plays louder. It's less, it's not quite as smooth. There's a little more variation from seat to seat, but you can bring you can catch all that up with uh, with signal processing, and the gain you get from the corners, which is between three and six dB, is extremely worth it. So just to be clear, three dB is twice the power. Six dB is four times the power. You can't get that back in just amplifiers. Okay, you just yeah. can't. So um, if you look and at, through and at base frequencies, the 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 perception of double of, of loudness is not yeah. 10 dB like the higher frequencies. It's about four or five dB. So you're really, when you're gaining those extra four or five dB from doubling your subs, you're getting them twice as loud at those very low frequencies. Yeah. Exactly, you get to a point where it's amazing. If you look at most of our designs in the last five, six, seven years, it's it's been four subwoofers somewhere in the corners, some low, some high. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Yeah. So before we talk about base traps, I just wanted to take a little break to let you know, I've got some nice dark chocolate almonds you might want to check these out. Mm, these are really good. That looks good. Skinny dipped, huh? So you get a little bit protein and you get your you get your chocolate fix. So, so you guys were watching. Why are we talking about this? Well, it turns out that Gene and I are both chocoholics. Yes. We're not just audioholics. There's more in life than just audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're chocoholics. And so we're always taunting each other with like this great new chocolate. And got well, I got something for you. Uh one of my staff people brought me a little box of Harry and David chocolate, like dark chocolate. Uh, um goodies and man those were good uh brought them home my wife just jumped right into one we ate one and a half uh really good so but good probably stuff. not as good as those skinny dip things though. yeah you gotta you definitely gotta get your money's worth for sure <laughs> so so the point of tonight's discussion is we want to talk about acoustical treatments we want to talk about bass traps but i also want the reader to understand that if you really want to do effective bass manipulation in your room Generally speaking, you want to do multi-sub because it lessens your need to do very low frequency absorption, which tends to be quite large or expensive or impractical. I'm not saying we don't need bass traps. I'm saying we can do both, but we could use the subwoofers. If you think of subwoofers, they're really an active bass trap, right? So they're fixing your room problems when they're turned on, whereas passive bass traps will fix your room problems regardless. If you're doing play, if you're doing sound reproduction, but we're talking about, or sound production, we're talking about sound reproduction. So that's why ba subwoofers work at the very low frequencies as an active bass trap. Yeah, yeah, you're totally right, Gene. Um, the, I, I guess I didn't finish on that story. The right way to do it is a combination of multiple mm -hmm. subwoofers tuned correctly with some level of some type of equalization, or, or the term is actually cool is developing is bass optimization. Um, I, lo I love being in this industry long enough to hear ideas become actually trademarked, uh, not registered trademarked, but now it's called base optimization. Base optimization okay. is the act of putting a bunch of subwoofers around, measuring them, tuning them, adjusting delay, time EQ to where you get the, the best base, right where the seats are. And you can actually think of it as cresting the waves right where you're sitting. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, so we could, we could do a follow up on the yeah. best techniques of where to put the subs oh. in the room. Absolutely. That's, that a, that's a whole thing in hours worth, if not more. So the right way to do bass, since it's so important, is a combination of acoustical solutions, or sometimes people call it mechanical, which which is some level of bass absorption coupled together 
with base optimization, which is the, the act of putting subwoofers in the right place. That's the right solution. And you're completely right that if you if you have a room in which there's problems at around 40 to 50 hertz, which our main listening room has a nasty problem at 45 hertz, nasty. The base, if you're just going to use acoustical solutions, the base trap devices get huge because 40 hertz is a really large wavelength. Uh, anybody know how long that is? About what was the frequency feet. you said? 45 hertz. Oh, probably it went 20, 30 feet. So it's 25 or so feet, something around uh -huh. like that. Somebody's probably going to like calculate and go, hey, you're wrong. It's 20, but it's, it's big. So you have to have big devices. And like you're in a room that's like 20 feet long. Where are you going to put things that can chew up 45 hertz? So you can't just rely on bass traps. Uh, yep. Focus. Coming back. Look at that. Um, so we got a super chat here from John Lim. He's asking, what do you do to improve reverb time in the 10 to 40 hertz region? Um, that's a very low region. I'm going to, I'm just want to say that if you get rid of any type of high peaks in that room with EQ, then that's going to fix your reverb time as well. Anytime you can get rid of a peak with EQ and it works for every seat. If you have multi-sub, that's really the fix right there. It's the amplitude response you have to look at. And, uh, uh, John, thanks for that great question. PHP, that's what Philippine dollars. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. And in, so I'm going to answer in, in the in the session that's coming. I've got a bunch of slides ready. Uh, like as usual, while I love chatting with Gene, there's a point at which I say, "Let's get out of here and start. Let's go yep. into some graphics." Um, in which I actually differentiate between what I call reflection decay time and standing wave control. They're kind of both work together, but just for the sake of recipes and simplification, I've sort of broken these things. But in small rooms, the rooms we work in, not a cathedral not a large concert hall, but in the rooms we're working, there isn't really reverberation ever. There is reflection decay, but it, that's because the term reverberation acoustics means the sounds bounced around enough that it's randomized to this fog of sound, like like that. You never really get to that in, in our listening rooms because they're too small. But um, the issues between 10 and 40 hertz in most of the rooms we work in are uh, standing waves. They, the, the actual thing that happens and there's resonances between the walls, the ceiling and floor that take over from, from sound energy bouncing around. So uh, to improve the, let's just talk about the general sound quality but between, between 10 and 40 hertz, you need some level of low frequency control through frictional devices, tympanic devices, things I'm gonna talk about. Um, and it, but you need to worry less about the reflection decay time than the standing waves at those frequencies. Somewhere around 80 or 90 hertz, depending on the size of the room, it starts to switch over where the standing wave character is not as important as the reflection decay time and other things like like um, boundary effects. So we're going to cover all that. Thanks cool. for thanks for asking that. So let me uh, share this uh, the screen here so we can get into your presentation. All right. And guys, if you're a patron, um, we have this full presentation on the Patreon channel. It's uh, patreon.com slash audioholics, and you can download this live presentation if you want to follow at your own leisure. Cool. Um, so let's get started. So th this session, to, it's funny, this, this series I've called Home Cinema Acoustics 101, I realize we're actually getting in depth that this should really be a 201, not a 301 mm -hmm. quite yet, but a 201. We're, we're actually going a little past the basics, This is which is really cool. So um, this particular issue on acoustics is still about sound reflection control. It's still about how to sound bounce around in a room. Uh, now, Gene being Italian, I'm waving my hands a lot, but am I correct in saying I'm, my faces and my hands are no longer on screen? Correct, yes. Oh my God, how can you do this to me? I'll keep doing it, without which I can't talk. I mean, I, if you get, so. Um, all right, so today's uh, session on reflection and reflection control is about the low frequencies. Um, the term is often used, uh, you know, we often say bass traps, but it's really an inappropriate term. Oh, by the way, I'm going to ask the audience. Uh, I have a microphone. It's got a certain gain. It's got a certain character through the the uh, stream process, and so does Gene. How are we both sounding? Am I very loud? Is Gene very loud? Am I really quiet? Just you know, type a little thing. It goes. You you guys are both right. I'm clipping or I'm overloading, distorting or whatever. Just let us know because yeah, and I, I, I lost the cable. I, I lost the cable to my good mic because we're moving everything around. So I'm using this little one. So I know my my voice is probably not as good. Or as clear as it normally is, but you know we're still moving along because we want to educate. Right. 
Uh, you sound, like I said before, Gene, you sound great to, to me, but anybody else listening out there through the stream, which we can't hear quite directly, let us know. I can turn my mic down, up, whatever. It looks right. like generally people say we look fine, so let us well, continue. We look fine, but do we sound okay? <laughs> um, so let's talk about bass traps. So I always like to, uh, in education, it's good to kind of bring up what we have already talked about. And I'm going to bring up a quick summary of the things we discussed, which is warning. If you want good sound, worry about room acoustics because room acoustics are going to mess you up. Uh, reflections around a room can lead to distortions. This is my little graphic to explain that a sound of a very good sounding saxophone, a, Sel a 1956 Selmer Mark VI is coming out of that center speaker you know or the left and right speakers played by coltrane it sounds beautiful and then it comes to you and then it bounces around the room and it can end up sounding like somebody just drove over the damn selmer saxophone that could be distortion not always want to be clear sometimes reflections do not cause those problems but sometimes they do and the solutions are the right combination of some types of absorption and scattering devices um and sometimes people make the misassumption that if a little bit of absorption or scattering is good, let's just go ahead and fill the whole room with it. No, 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 do not do it. We need to preserve some amount of reflection in the room because humans do expect some reflections and elim eliminating all of them is bad. Uh, without any reflections, you sit in the room like with this little graphic over here, you know, with, with seen from above, exclamation point, question mark on what just happened here? This is not sounding so good. So we need to preserve some amount of reflections in a room so that we can support the speakers correctly and actually aid them. So this whole series is about, well, what do we do to the walls? What, what reflections do we keep? What do we absorb? What do we scatter? Where do we put them? And I'm gradually over the course of a number of weeks getting through that. So um, ultimately what we're trying to get to is this effect where there's a really nice direct sound coming to you that's accompanied by a, a number of reflected sound energy points around the room that give you this nice enveloping uh, that, it, that's, it, that tastes as good as a nice butter croissant that you eat in the cafe in Paris in the morning with a wonderful cappuccino and a little chocolate. That's what we're trying to get to. All right. You get the image, right? Very nice. I'm thinking of a hot mocha right now. Mm, hot mocha with a butter croissant. Okay, and in order to get there, I've talked about this a little bit, I think next week we're finally gonna get to putting this all together. All it takes is about 15% of absorption surfaces distributed evenly through the room, including the um, the low frequency, by the way, to reduce the reflected energy, and about 15 to 20% of diffusive surfaces around the room scattered around, some 2D in the front, some 3D in the back, that's what works. So now let's talk about this one particular part of uh, uh, absorption, which is the low frequency absorbers, also known sometimes as base traps. Base traps, I would say, is the vulgarized term to describe a, an, an absorber working in the low frequency, especially uh, re relying on, uh, on, on forms of, I, I, I would say, resonance rather than friction. So let's get into this. So um, there are two purposes to worry about low frequency absorption. Think of it that why are we here to today? Why are we spending our time? You know, you guys on the East Coast at 11 p.m., you guys on the West Coast of the U.S. at 8 p.m., you guys in the rest of the world that God only knows what time you're sitting here. Why are we here to talk about this? There's two things we want to worry about on the lower frequencies. One is to control the reflection decay time all the way down to about a 200 hertz. So the last session I talked about diffusion, the session before I talked about absorption, most absorbers work down to maybe 500 hertz, maybe a little bit lower and then poop out. Maybe sometimes they work down to 250 if, if you've gotten really thick ones that are four inches or five inches thick, which is 10 or 15 centimeters, uh, 15 centimeters is six inches. Um, and then below that, most people go, I'm not doing anything. Well, so now if you don't do anything below that, the reflection in the, in the room, the reverb, uh, like was asked by, uh oh, what was his name? The guy who uh, just came low frequency. Lim, I think it was Lynn. John uh, Lim. John Lim. Yeah. Um, here's Jim, John. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so below that, below 200 or 300, 400, if you don't do anything, well, the reverb, or really more accurately, the reflection decay time starts to increase, or the amount of energy coming back from the room starts to increase. That's not good. And that's not good because you want the direct sound to hit you, and then you want reflected sound energy to, to come back to you, but uh, with the equal spectrum of the direct sound. So one purpose of talking about low frequency absorbers as special devices is to control the reflection decay time or the reverb control all the way down. 
The other purpose, probably more important and way more audible, is to control the standing wave resonances through the right kind of damping, something to control those resonances. And that's really in most of the rooms we work in is between 30 hertz and 200 hertz. And you may think, well, why do we not worry about 20 hertz? Well, in the majority of construction around the world, when you get to 20 hertz, the walls are actually flexing around enough, things are moving enough that they're absorbing the base naturally or generally transmitting it to the room next door that standing waves, uh, the base transmits out, and you're also way below the standing wave frequency, uh, depending on the distance between the front, back, left, right, and top and bottom wall. So, um, so most of the standing waves we need to worry about in most of the rooms that the listenership over here is, is interested in is, you know, I'd say between 40 or 50 hertz and up to about 80 hertz. That's where there are standing waves in the room sizes we're worrying about. So a little bit more about standing waves, also known sometimes as room mode, room modes or eigentones. Uh, there's a bunch of different words for the same thing, but it's it's the fact that there's a um, an actual resonance that is set up by the fact that the wave is as long as the room or twice as long as the room or or one and a half waves fit in the room. They When they basically fit between the, le the, the front and back walls, the left and right, and top and bottom, they resonate. Just like the string on a guitar, string on a piano, they go wing and, and they hang. And I've heard rooms in which there are resonances that are actually coincidence between the, co between the front and back wall and left and right wall in, in walls that are very stiff, like in rooms that are concrete or stone, and in which a certain frequency let's say randomly 45 hertz in a room that's pretty big, just gets put in the room and hangs for two seconds. So that resonance where you, you put a sound in the room, like, a, a, like 40 hertz or 42 hertz is the bottom E of a bass guitar. You play that and it sits in the, it hangs in the room for two seconds, not acceptable because you want the sound to go in the room and die out as fast as the mid and high frequencies. So those resonances uh, create really rough frequency response they really affect the bass impact because instead of having the sound hit you and have good good kind of thumpy tone, it goes wow, which is kind of this, this mush of sound. And additionally, there can be different bass at every seat. Differences of 20 or 30 decibels from seat to seat are not uncommon in rooms at those frequencies. So we're gonna- what you're, what you're describing when you hear that overhanging bass is often why people think that ported subs sound slower than sealed subs is because these ported subs have more output. They're exciting those room modes. Right. And automatically people think a ported sub is not as accurate as a sealed sub. And it's right. really about controlling your standing waves in the right. room more than the right. sub. Abs so. Absolutely. The, the one thing that ported subs have, which is what nobody talks about, is that at a higher, at high levels, they start to chuff. Yeah, there's actually wind noise for them, which is distortion, which is not audible as slow or fast. It's just audible as like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to do a lot of work on ports to actually make them sound really smooth, which the better manufacturers do. It's nothing to do with fast or slow. Look, all subwoofers are playing low frequencies. They're all slow. End of story. <laughs> yeah, yeah? Exactly. The highest frequency most subwoofers are designed to play is 100 hertz. That's 10 milliseconds. That's forever in, in the space of audio. Very, very slow. So don't worry about that. But but do realize that as you start to excite lower and lower frequencies in the room, you're going to start to hear problems with the standing waves. So um, low frequency absorbers come in all kinds of types. Uh, frictional being the first one, the cheapest one, which is which relies on scrubbing off energy and relies on flow of of waves through the through the air inside. The device. I'm going to give you plenty of slides on this. Just remember that there's frictional friction. Like if you do this, if everybody actually, you can't see my, my camera. Actually, let's try this. Can you switch me back to camera real quick, Gene? Okay, there you go. Go like this a few times. No, no, no. You got to put your fingers like this. Not in it like that. Notice like your hand. Arm. Okay, that's friction. Uh. Friction creates heat. So, um, yep, yeah, you can you feel right there. So that I'll explain why I had you do that. Next thing, uh, back to the the, uh, the slide, is diaphragmatic absorbers, also known sometimes as flexural, tympanic. There's a bunch of words, but it's basically where there's a diaphragm that's a, that's causing the absorption. I'll explain how that works. Uh, Helmholtz is another type in which there's actually a port that creates absorption through friction. Um, and then there's other strategies, but the, those three above there are the most common ones: frictional. Uh, diaphragmatic, also known as, as like I said, uh, flexural, tympanic, and other ones, um, and Helmholtz, which is a, a, a resonator. There's essentially a big wine bottle. Think of it that way. 
Now, let's first look at frictional absorbers. Frictional absorbers are usually used in the mids and high frequencies. And if you have a room scene from above with a speaker and a, a sound that's a direct path to the listener and an off axis path, the absorptive material that would be put on the walls is gonna convert that energy through friction is gonna convert it into heat. Um, now, how does that work? This is a kind of a close up view of the absorber surface. Um, in most of my diagrams, I use pink as absorbers. And that's sort of a funny thing that comes from the fact that Owens Corning has always used a pink color to describe their, their absorbers. They dye it with pink. And it's, they've used the Pink Panther as their logo. So I just use that as pink. So a frictional absorber is a device that when the sound, the air molecules hit it, they, they go back and forth inside and they, vi they, they actually skirt through the different fibers in there. And through friction, they convert the acoustic energy into heat, okay? Just, just like I had you do with your hands, uh -huh. right? Now, how much heat? Well, very, very little. You'd have to play really stupid loud before you could even measure a thousandth of a degree of increase. There was a paper by um, an English physicist that calculated that all of the sound energy of a Beatles concert of the one at Wembley Stadium, the famous one with all these pictures, all that energy focused onto a cup of tea after two hours could boil a cup of tea. Yeah, and that was so, back in the 60s. Imagine the concerts now, how loud they are. Okay, so the concerts now would take half an hour or an hour. Yeah, but all yeah. this to say that sound is actually a thing that, that we hear is very loud, but it's actually not that much physical energy, like the displacement, the movement yeah. of air molecules, the energy we're imparting on air molecules is not that much, where it would take a whole hour of a metal concert to boil a cup of tea. Not that you boil a cup of tea at a, at a concert. The thing about the Beatles and the cup of tea is it's so British. I love it. So <laughs> now... Um, a, a frictional absorption is interesting in that it, for it to work at the various frequencies, you need different thicknesses of absorbers. A one inch absorber, I, this is sort of an expansion of a slide I showed before. A one inch absorber, which is 25 millimeters, is gonna work down to one kilohertz and then poop out because the waves are too big for the size of the absorber. Mm -hmm. A two inch absorber is gonna work down to 500 hertz. A four inch absorber, which is 100 millimeters, 10 centimeters, is gonna work down to 250 hertz. An eight inch absorber, 20 centimeters, works down to 125. And if you want stuff to work down to 63 hertz, which is a reasonable frequency for bass, you need 16, 16 inches, that's that's 40 centimeters. I can't even fit that you know, in this camera. That's huge. Actually, you're not looking at the camera. Well, there you go. It's, 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 it's incredibly it's like, impractical. You're better off just putting in a couple extra subs to balance your base at that point. If you're it's gonna, impractical. That's your only, yeah, that's your as, only option. As a frictional device, so a big chunk of fiberglass, it's just impractical. And here's some curves that show what I just described. You know, The green one shows that you would have to use 200 millimeters, eight inches worth of thick material to, to tackle 125 hertz, not practical. Um, so these are, these are simple little diagrams in color. These are actually real measurements from, from a, um, a measurement chamber that shows the effects of absorption of one inch, two inch, three inch, and four inch. And this chart shows the absorption coefficient. So how much the device absorbs, one being kind of perfect um, and frequency on this side. So you can see that one inch works down to about a thousand hertz and poops out and four inch works down to about 150 or so hertz and poops out. Now, why is this higher than one when where one is 100% absorption? It's an interesting idiosyncrasy of the measurement technique where they put panels on the floor of a room that is measured in reverb time before and after you put the panels. And in fact, some of the absorption is contributed by the sides. So you put four inch thick panels, 100 millimeter thick panels down on the floor, like all spaced out, and you're getting absorption from the top and the sides, but the calculation refers it back into the square footage of the visible area on the top. So that's why you end up with more absorption. In reality, when you put a four inch panel in a wall, as long as you don't occlude the sides, you actually get that extra kick. So those are real measurements. Now, um, at low frequencies, our problem with acoustical fibers is that it relies on friction. For standing wave control, which is a slightly different process than just random waves bouncing around, you actually need to you need to have panels that are a quarter of the wavelength that you're trying to deal with. So let's say you had a room that had real serious problems at 50 hertz, which is really common. 50 hertz. 50 hertz is the main frequency of a kick drum. 50 hertz is the main frequency in a rumble in a movie when things are going boom, 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 crash, crash. If you look at the spectrum there, it's between 50 and 60 hertz. Well, 
Uh, a full wavelength at, at 50 hertz is about 20 feet. A quarter wavelength is five feet or 5.6 to be exact, which is 1.73 meters. That means that if you wanna control through friction, just a big chunk of fiberglass or rock wool or thick compressed polypropy something or other, it needs to be almost two meters thick or five, five, five and a half feet thick, not practical. So any manufacturer that's out there selling you a thing they call a base trap that looks like it's just made out of a thick, thick chunk of foamy or fibery kind of stuff, it ain't really a base trap. It's a it's a, an absorber that maybe works down to two or 300 hertz, but if you have base problems in a room, it's not uh, standing wave base problems, it's not gonna tackle them. You'll well, what them about when they put an offset, when they say oh. if you put a four inch offset, it'll increase the low frequency absorption. So how much do you have to have offset it? So a four inch offset, four inches from the wall, is going to work, let's go back over here, it is going to work almost like eight inches. So it's going to work down to 125 hertz. Uh -huh. If you have a room with 50 hertz problems, it's barely going to start to tackle it. So wait, I'm glad you asked that question because there's a little trick coming up. So look at this diagram. This is a room, I don't know, whatever. Maybe it's a, it's a 20 foot room from front to back that's got a problem at 50 hertz, typical for a 20 foot room, uh, which is six meters long. I'm, I know there's a lot of international people, so I translate back and forth in meters and feet. Mm -hmm. By the way, for the record, we should all change to meters, okay? Enough <laughs> of this foot and thumb and all this complicated crap where you have to multiply by eights and twelves. You know you know what feet and, and inches are good for? Keeping your math going. Nothing yeah, else. That's now true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> now back to our program. So this is a six-meter room, 20-foot long. It has problems at 50 hertz in, in the length. If you want to get rid of standing waves, you need, you need, a, you need to put five feet or you know, a meter 50 or meter 60 of fuzz behind you, not practical, okay? Um, so this is another view of the same thing. This is actually the same 20 foot long room. That's you sitting here in, in your director's chair, wearing a red hat, enjoying your music or your movie. And if, it, if there, there will be standing waves if the room has stiff enough walls and the standing waves are gonna look like this. They'll be loud here. It'll be quiet here, loud here, quiet here, loud there. And that would be in a room that's 20 feet, um, about six meters, that at 50 hertz would put a hole at one, one quarter of the room, a peak at two quarters, which is a half, and a dip over here at three quarters of the room. If you happen to sit there, if you happen to sit at three quarters of the way back in the room, you'll hear very little 50 hertz. For and that room size dimension. For that, that room size. Yeah. If the room yeah. is longer, that dip is going to become 45 and then 40 as long as you move back with it. Uh -huh. Of course, if you don't sit here, if you move forward, if you sit over here, you don't hear that dip so much. So a lot of the trick around getting good base is a combination of multiple subwoofers, base absorption, and seating location. If you Positional hold, EQ. Pos positional EQ of your subwoofers in your seats, which we'll all talk about in another session. Right, Gene? Uh -huh. um, I, I did a... Uh, a session at the ISE show, which is the uh, international version of Cedia. It was a three hour lecture on just this, three hours to get over it. And people at the end were like, wow, this is cool. Anyway, yeah, so, so, so a quick tip to people, if you're not happy with the base in your room before you go and upgrade your sub, try changing your seating location and try moving your subs around. That's called positional EQ, yeah. can be night or day difference. I yeah. can't tell you how many people over buy subs because they didn't set their original subs up correctly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a big trick is put the subwoofer on a little dolly with four wheels. You sit at the main seat position li listening to either film or pink noise or something that's constant bass or, or music and have somebody else just move the subwoofers around. The dolly is to, to save your back, right? These subwoofers mm -hmm. are heavy. But it's also to have a nice constant movement of the subwoofers so you can actually hear it. So it's not pick up, move, pick up, move, but actually continuous. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed how that thing's going to change. You won't yep. even believe it's the same subwoofer. So... Um, all right, so here you are sitting in this room, let's just say for the sake of 50 Hertz, the room's about 20 feet long. It's it's about six meters long. There's no, there's no base. So you, you you need to put about five feet, um, you know, about a meter 50 or so of, of fuzz, of, of thick fiberglass, rock wool, foam, whatever it is, not practical. Um, if you did that, the standing wave character would look like this black line, which is the, the dip would go from minus 20 or minus 30 to maybe minus four or five. And that is wonderful, but not practical. Now check it out. If you actually put one thin panel, two or three inches thick, so 
five to 10 centimeters thick, right at that null right here, you will also get the same effect. You're talking about on the side walls in those positions? Um, I'm just showing you a room that's front to back. Uh -huh. uh, it's, I'm still showing you something kind of impractical up to a certain yeah, point. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a room that's 20 foot long. I, I'm not caring, not caring about the widths, just 20 foot long. And you're sitting at, at this location over here, which if this room's 20 foot long, this is 10 feet, that's two and a half feet, right? Um, or five feet, sorry. You're sitting five feet from the back wall. Right. Um, and if you were to put a big absorber panel at five feet from the front wall, you would reduce the standing waves. How is that possible? How does that happen? Well, right at this location, I'm gonna get a little geeky with the math. If there is high pressure here, and low pressure here, and high pressure here. Those of you who remember high school math, uh, physics or chemistry, remember that PV equals NRT. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Boyle's law. Um, where there's high pressure, the velocity of particles is low, as in you compress things and the air molecules can't really move. When the pressure is low, the velocity of molecules is high. If you, if you didn't respect that, you're going against the laws of physics and you're out of here. You, you're expelled like in Monty Python, Boom, you're gone. <laughs> doesn't work. So right at this location where there's low sound pressure, there, there happens to be very high velocity particle of molecules. Now you don't hear that because your ears are sensitive to pressure. It's actually the pressure going in and out of your eardrums that creates the sensation of sound. So here at that frequency, there's low pressure, low change of pressure with time, but a lot of high par particle velocity. Here there's high part of particle velocity, and that's a good place to put a panel. So how do, you, how do you build a theater in which you've got like this big wall of panel right there? Impractical. Well, yeah, but I work in rooms sometimes that are narrow and long, right? Like let's say a room is 15 foot wide and it's 28 foot long just because that's what was available. And a lot of people are like, what are we going to do with this? And it's like, we're going to actually crop the room, but we're going to crop it with a big, big fr with framing that's going to be filled with dense absorption. And by doing that at the right strategic location, you get rid of the standing waves. And the base is really nice. So totally counterintuitive. You get strong base by absorbing it. What? No, what you're doing is you're absorbing the region of frequency where there are standing wave problems. And that's the trick. So this is a kind of counterintuitive uh, issue number one. So to, so get, to visualize where you're doing this, you can't do this in the middle of the room because you'd be blocking the screen and stuff. So where are these being put? Are they being put on the sidewalls? So you you could put them on the sidewalls. Uh, you, but this is really only a solution when you have it where ideally this is a solution where you have a room that you can actually shorten, which happens more often than you think, Gene. Very, very often, an architect has said, well, here's here's the home cinema. They've given the room like a very long dimension and way too narrow. And long and narrow just ends up with really poor surround integration, a screen that's too far away from you, so it's really big at the front rows and really small at the back rows. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do with rooms that are long and narrow is reduce their length, but reduce them not with a hard wall, instead a soft wall. So that's what I'm showing here. Anyway, this is conceptual, okay? Now, right. Um, so bottom line about frictional absorbers, so chunks of fiber, some type of chunk of fiber is that they're too thick to work in the base frequencies. As a reminder, 125 Hertz re requires eight inch thick material. We should be looking at different topologies. So this is to say that any manufacturer or any designer that's talking about base absorbers or base traps and shows up with something that's just a big squishy foam panel, you should just go, yeah, that's not going to work. Instead, you need to be looking at these other topologies. Tympanic resonators, also known as diaphragm. Cavity resonators, also, also often, uh, that's the generic term. They're known as Helmholtz. Why are they known as Helmholtz? There's a guy called Helmholtz from the 1870s who did seminal work in room acoustics. Unbelievable. If you pick up his papers from back then, the guy was able with Rube Goldberg, Goldberg methods before electronics were invented to do a lot of work on acoustics. And he actually invented the resonators that go in the Steinway pianos and made them sound so warm, like the big, big bottom end those guys have is from him putting resonators um, in their Helmholtz. Mm. Um, other topologies are perforated enclosures, spring-loaded enclosures, active schemes. Let's talk about those. So first one, tympanic resonators. What, the, what, what does that look like? So 
if you take a room that's resonant, 50 hertz, I don't know, we're, let's keep talking about our 20 foot room that's got a, a set, series of 50 hertz problems, right, as an example. So again, six meter, pro six meter room. Um, if instead of putting fiberglass, rock wool, or other friction, uh, frictional absorbers, you instead build a, a diaphragm, like a build big drum head. So a big framed device that's got a, um, a panel in front of it that resonates at 50 hertz. When you hit it, it goes boom. How do you figure out that it's going to resonate at 50 hertz? Well, you look it up on the internet. I don't have time to give you the equations. Uh, no, I, I think in this presentation, I don't show it. Just look it up, you know, uh, equations for tympanic or diaphragm absorber. Um, relatively simple. Are those um, high Q or low Q when you say that? Very excellent question. If you don't put anything in the box, it'll be very high Q, which is uh, in, very in narrow. Systems. That means it'll resonate at just one frequency like a drum head. And it will only work at that one frequency you're thinking you're building it for. You're thinking, you're hoping you're building it for. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem with most of those. Most of the designs call for a wood frame with a, with a plywood panel in front. And the plywood, is, its mass and its flexure and its damping is going to change with temperature and humidity. So one day it will ring at 50 hertz. The next day you come along, if, if things have changed a little bit, it'll ring at 45 hertz. The next day it'll ring at 55 hertz. So they're unpredictable unless you can actually have extreme temperature and humidity control in your room. Uh, extreme, like it has to be exactly 45% humidity at exactly 18 degrees or 19 degrees exactly every day and you can tune it with a little mass, they're going to be unreliable. I know this because I used to build them a lot. It did, didn't always work. I measured them. You can measure them with an expensive device called an accelerometer, or you can use that old uh, tone arm and cartridge from a, a crappy old turntable you're not using anymore, and you can put it right, just rest that right on the panel, and you can either hit it with your finger very lightly like this, or you can play a tone in it, changing in frequency, and where suddenly there's a resonance, which is the needles moving, and you can look at it through a, 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 a preamp, a tone, a, a, a phono preamp and look at it on a spectrum analyzer using REW, you'll see what resonance they go. Yeah, it's called Rube Goldberg, okay? Um, Gene, I used to use an old SME tone arm that I wasn't using anymore with a really nice Shure V14, a, a V15 4 to do that until I realized, what am I doing? This is a really nice rig. <laughs> Back off and put a crappy old tone arm on there. Um, but um, putting a little bit of fuzz in there, some, some absorption, uh, some fiberglass, some foam will broaden the Q, as, it, as in make the make the panel less resonant at one frequency. It reduces it, but it makes it a broader band panel and not so sensitive to temperature and humidity. And that's the right way to build those. Don't overstuff it. If you fill it all completely, it's not going to work anymore. You just have, have to put 10 or 20% of the volume. How large are we talking about when you do these? Yeah, pretty large. Uh, it depends. It, it all depends on how much you're trying to absorb out of the room. But you're talking about panels that need to be four foot by four foot or several two foot by four foot, you know, 60 by 120 before you start to see an effect in the room. So I worked on rooms or I've seen rooms in which there's a whole bunch of these things distributed all over of different thicknesses, different depths, different materials to catch all, all the different frequencies you got to catch. Uh -huh. So that's, you, you, uh, if you, you know, open books on acoustics or recording studio design, they're going to say, yeah, build bass traps this way. And in reality, it kind of works, kind of not so much. It's, it's unreliable is basically what's in the slide. It, it works, but it's not it's not great. Certainly, if you're building a mixed use room in which it's a combination of a living room, playroom, theater, you can't put these things everywhere. In a dedicated room, maybe you have room to hide a bunch of these all over the place, but it's not not super practical. Hmm. So, um, a, a so the, the, I'll just loosely put that into the area of tympanic absorbers or flexural absorbers. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to do that. Let's switch gears to the next thing I had suggested, which is cavity absorbers, also known as Helmholtz. So the, the idea there is you build, you build an enclosure, a box of some size, and you put a port in, in front of it that in which the relationship of the surface area of the port and the length of the port relative to the enclosure volume is such that there's a resonance at some frequency. And that's exactly what happens when you blow on a bottle, whether it's Coca-Cola, wine, beer, whatever it is. And you notice as you drink the beer, the resonance goes down to a lower frequency. It's not just that you're getting more drunk. Yes, you are. But it just goes down in frequency because the relationship between the size 
of the aperture at the top and the neck of the bottle relative to the volume inside starts to change. So how do you figure out what that is? Look at the equations online. That's a bit of a bit more complicated equation, but they're plentiful and available. Um, and so the design of it's complicated, uh, but the equations, if you know, if, if th there's people who have these little calculators online, you just do it and you figure out what it is. So they work really well. They're very reliable. If, if you design one for 60 hertz, they, they work okay. If you design it for 80 hertz, they're a bit more efficient, but they, they work at that frequency very reliably, except that they're inefficient. And they're inefficient because they only absorb over the area of the neck. Whoops, go back. So how much of these do you have to put in a room? So just like you asked your question before, how many of these panels do you need? Well, uh, same thing over here. You will need a whole bunch of these things put in the room. Lots in the, like every corner is going to need a bunch of these to treat a problem at 50 hertz or 60 hertz or 70 hertz, wherever you've detected that there's a standing wave in the room. Again, this could be more easily addressed with multi-sub. Yes. Or a combination of things. Combination, yeah, but definitely the sub multiple subs for sure. So um, I've done work with a really good studio designer in England who takes this approach. He builds cubic rooms that have horrible standing waves at one frequency or a, at one series of frequencies. So let's say 30 hertz, 60 hertz, 90 hertz. Totally predictable because it's cube, it's rigid. And then he stuffs all of the corners with absorbers for 30, 60, and 90. Hmm. It works. It's one way to do it. You, you correlate the problem to one core area of frequency, and then you kill it just with those one frequencies. Well, we don't all have that ability to build these rooms that are completely built from scratch. You have to room, often work in a room that's already there. So, And more importantly, way, you often work in rooms that are not rectangular, so you can't predict all this stuff. Right. Think about right. that in Florida, especially. You, you almost never have a, a dedicated rectangular room for a, a right. theater. Right. Right there, there are other shapes. So um, I've been mentioning you have a problem at 60 hertz or 50 hertz or whatever. How do you find out? Well, you measure it. And I think we don't really have time to get much into it. I think this would be another session to go. You're in the room. There is a problem in the base. You can tell because the base is not clear. Well, how do you find what frequency there is? There are some pretty cool, simple ways to do that. I'll, I'll talk about that later. But mm -hmm. let's see. Once you determine what the frequency is, Let's just say it was 82 hertz, random number here. You can build a Helmholtz resonator that is going to absorb 82 hertz. Just expect to be putting a lot of them all over the room. So in the two front corners on the bottom, two front corners on the top, co corners in the bottom, you know, all over. So um, now, wait, all is not lost. There is a way to couple the two things I just mentioned and big enough surface area to make it all work. And I call that a distributed perforated absorber. So imagine you build a box, which is the tympanic absorber I mentioned earlier, and it's a certain volume inside, um, and you perforate the front, instead of having one big hole, you distribute that hole, that big hole, to a bunch of smaller holes. Now you have, have a distributed Helmholtz absorber over an area that's bigger, you can make a panel that maybe covers, you know, the whole uh, bottom of a room from front to back underneath your, your treatment. So let's say up to 24 or 30 inches and or the whole back wall made out of this, again, this frame with perforated wood in the front, maybe quarter inch, maybe half inch. And you put a little bit of, in, of uh, fiberglass, rock wool, other fibrous material inside. And you, you have something that can actually work pretty well. And you probably want to build this with a, a f at a few different frequencies. Maybe you'll find in your standing ways that you have a problem at, you know, again, random number generators, 45, 63, and 82, whatever. You, so you build it for three different frequencies out of this perforated thing. And now you got something that works pretty well. Okay. How thick, how thick would something like this be now? Um, they, you know, they start being efficient for the higher frequencies around three inches and they go up to eight or 10 inches. So mm -hmm. still not super thin. Depends on what frequencies you are. And you're right. Four subwoofers properly distributed deals with it. However, four subwoofers is only going to deal with a few f a resonant frequencies at the lower frequencies. You still need to work on reflection decay time and some resonances above where the four subwoofers may get. Oh, ready. yeah, ab absolutely. Above 80 hertz, subwoofers right. are useless. Most so of the time, yeah. I'm, well, you can take them up to 100 if you want, but above yeah, that, yeah. it's dangerous. Yeah. How, how high do you want to take a subwoofer, by the way? That's a whole other topic. It really depends if you, yeah, we should talk about that. But if you have the subs towards the front of the room, you could go a little bit higher if they're closer to the main speakers. Otherwise, if they're closer to the listening area, you really don't want to go 
much higher than 80 hertz. It depends on the steepness of the it, filter it, too. It depends on the subwoofer for the filter, but research that was done about 30 years ago, very well done, um, uh, showed that most human beings start to detect a subwoofer to your side at around 125 hertz. And, the, and everybody has detected it by 180 hertz. So yeah. you can go above 80, you can go to 90 or 100. I try to stay below 100 because, because a few people could actually detect, hey, the bass is coming from here and the sound's over here. Eh, don't really like it. Yeah. So, um, all right, follow all this. Now, what do we do with all this, in, this information? Um, uh, bottom line is, the right way to think of this is the combination, and Gene, thanks so much for, for kind of setting me up for this. The right combination of the right kind of base absorbers, also known as base traps, the, mm. the right locations for subwoofers, the right location for the seats, um, and then plan on some tuning and tweaking with equalization, yeah. either yep. manual yep. or digital. Okay, so um, now I'm going to finish out with some product solutions. What, uh, some people are DIYers that are listening and they just want to build everything. So there's a few guys right now, they've already gone down to their, their, where their, uh, their workshop and they're, they're perforating little holes into wood and they're building a frame as I speak. And then there's the rest of us who would rather just sit around and drink coffee and eat chocolate. Right? So there are product solutions from a bunch of different manufacturers. I will start off by talking about the stuff I've worked on because I'm, I know it really well. Uh, the first, the first one, and I'm, uh, I, I have to qualify this by saying we no longer make this product. So I'm not even making money by telling you it exists. It's more, it's more of an exploration into, wow, how interesting. So to be fair about, I'm going to say 15 years ago, I hired a postdoc student from Europe to come over and work for me on a bunch of different things, including these issues of standing waves. And he had this brilliant idea of using a spring for flexure control rather than, than the edges of a tympanic absorber. And I'm gonna show you that. So out of that came a patent, an AES paper, and a product called a spring trap. Um, we no longer build it right now because we're in the transition between vendors and it turns out to be really expensive to build. And I don't know, I'm not sure if people want it anymore. So, um, and, and the discovery of four subwoofers around the room kind of means that, well, you can just do a lot of that stuff with, with tuning. So the spring trap is a combination of this diaphragm absorber using pistonic character and a, and a Helmholtz resonator. So here's a cutaway view of it. Uh, th this is a, uh, a normal view of it. It is. It actually looks like a giant uh, corner loaded subwoofer or speaker. So you put it in a corner of the room If and there's a grill on it. You peel the grill back and you'll see this is giant. Uh, it's actually four foot wide, two foot tall plywood membrane that looks like a big, big woofer. Um, so would you go floor to ceiling with this or you only use about a five foot piece? Um, it, we, you you can, depending piece. on the size of the room, you put either one in, in a corner or you stack two of them or you put one in the front left corner, one in the front right corner, depends on the room and where there are problems. But this thing is four foot tall. One of them in a corner deals with about 150 square feet of room. So 15 square meter room. If your room is 30 square meters, you need two of them. So what you'll see is that there, the perimeter of this looks just like the, the, the rubber gasket, what's called a surround on a woofer. If you cut it in two, and this is just a, a drawing of it, you'll see that that diaphragm is actually internally mounted on precision springs that are suspended on an intermediate baffle that has a hole in it. So it's a, it's a membrane mounted on six springs that are uh, in which the mass of the membrane is made to be uh, uh, correlated to the K factor of the spring, the hardness of the spring, so that it rings around 70 hertz, which is kind of the, the core resonance frequency of most rooms we're interested in. So um, now it is ringing into a sealed enclosure, but not completely sealed. This first enclosure is ported to a second enclosure, which is then ported into a third enclosure that comes out the bottom into the, the bottom of the cabinet. Um, this is made to be resonant around 85 hertz. This is made to be resonant around 50 hertz, and that's to be made to be resonant around 40 hertz. So this is actually a giant pressure device that's, that in itself resonates around 70 hertz and excites three Helmholtz resonators over three frequencies over the regions we're interested in. So it's sort of like a triple Helmholtz resonator that's amplified in terms of its action into the room by this large baffle. So it actually combines 
uh, flexural or, or tympanic absorption in terms of its exposure to the room with Helmholtz, which is very reliable. So um, crazy thing, got a patent on it, like I said, uh, really cool, very, very difficult to design. We, we, we did a lot of cycles of engineering and physics on this. We ended up hiring a group out of Australia that was specializing in fluid dynamics to really calculate it all out. It was really crazy. How um, much would something like that cost? I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, bet to, to, to determine if it's more cost effective to do that or to do an extra subwoofer, you know, it's like, what are you looking at for a couple yeah. of those panels? So this thing retails for $920. So that's a subwoofer right there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a subwoofer. Um, yeah. So there's there's some manufacturers out there that make really good subwoofers for $920. Yep. Yep. Um, two, two of them, which is what you need for a 300 square foot room, which isn't that big, is $1,840. So yep. you kind of see my financial conundrum, right? Um, the right thing, of course, to do is to have four subwoofers and four of these guys, and you'll have Nirvana of bass, right? Wonderful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, the, can you build this into a room under new construction, like before the drywall's up? Can you actually have an art someone come in and actually frame something in that would respond like this, so it's part of the room and it's not a device you have to add after the fact? Uh, yes, but you wouldn't build it this way. You would actually build the the surfaces of the wall so that they absorb the right way. And we should we should do a session. I'm like base is important enough that it's worth talking about over yeah, the over. Yeah. Mids and highs are not that hard to get right. Right. Uh, yeah, the base, base is the hardest. Because the room the, dominates the base response. The, the room will will just mess with you. Yep. And there's nothing that makes people more impressed. Like let let's say that it's important for you to have good sound. But let's say it's also important for you to show off to your friends. You bring them over and, and you play a little track of music or a film and the bass is just like, and it's like moving you and, and nothing is going to make them more impressed than tight, punchy, rich bass. I don't care how good your mids are, how good your imaging is, how you surround them, all that stuff that us audioholics worry about. Our buddies that don't know stuff about this, um, they're going to love the base and to get good base, you need to work really hard at it because the room's going to screw you up. So um, I think we, I think we should talk more about this. So um, there, there's a fair amount of knowledge about how you can build walls so that they absorb at the right frequencies with the right damping character and all this other stuff. And we, we can go into that. Mm -hmm, for sure. So, um, a little more about this. Now uh, we, we documented the results uh, of the effectiveness of, uh, effectiveness of this absorber in kind of a novel way using at the basis some really cool work done by an acoustician in Switzerland called Dirk Noy, um, but came up with this concept in, des in describing a base absorber as how much standing wave can it actually eliminate over time? Not absorption coefficient, but if a room has a standing wave where it builds its resonance over time, over time, like over a second or two, and it goes, kind of goes, woo, woo, you put a bass trap, a good bass trap in there, how much does it reduce that reflection time, that, that resonance time? You put two of them, how much does it reduce it? So here's a really crazy measurement that shows over time in a concrete bunker that had resonances. This is the beginning of time. That's two who's, in, who's in the concrete bunker. What kind of, is this like an old uh, leftover bunker from like World War II? Uh, this was this was actually a bunker in a military in a in a closed military base north of San Francisco. Interesting, because the, the worst kind of walls you could have, obviously, are concrete because they're infinitely absolutely. rigid and your standing yep. waves are the strongest. Yep. Really strong standing waves. And this room at 53 hertz would ring and ring. You play 50 hertz, actually. So the test, I'll, I'll spoiler alert, I'll talk about this later, is, uh, is you play 50, 53 hertz. You play it, and then you shut it off. You mute it. And instead mm -hmm. of just going away, it goes, boo. It actually sounds like it decreases in frequency, which is a psychoacoustic issue. But it just hangs. Yeah. It hangs because it's resonating. The waves are going back and forth and back and forth. And so you can see in this room, um, actually what you're seeing is a change of resonance, but at 53 Hertz, this room can't kept going on. And we, we measured the room before putting the spring trap in and then after the spring trap and did a subtraction of the two. And this shows the reduction of resonance at that frequency over time. And then we collapsed all of that, averaged it out and it shows the actual effectiveness over time of the of the uh, trap. So this particular trap worked, uh, started at three hertz, worked 
up to 50 at this point and up to 70 at that point. This is really the, the core region of issues yeah. in most rooms. And it shows the amount of standing wave energy it could sap out of the room. So it's a totally different way to look at this. So it could absorb up to 25 dBs worth of uh, standing wave energy. Okay. And more on this much later. Now, um, that product is expensive. Like I said, we stopped making it. I get pinged all the time by people who had bought some or had specced it and used it in projects and want to get more. We're not making it anymore. We're making a thing that's way simpler and works pretty well. And in the world of four subwoofers plus treatment plus EQ, this is kind of what you want. So uh, in our Sonatus line, we have this thing called a deco trap, big chunk of dense foam, polyester foam with, with a membrane section in the front that actually is, is acting to resonate with with the low frequency waves and get damped by the foam behind. Works pretty well from 60 hertz up to 500 hertz. Below 60, I'll be totally honest, it don't do much. But below that, that's where your four subwoofers are doing the work or your the, the flexural absorption of your walls are taken over. And so it's available in many finishes. You can get it this color, that color, that style. Uh, hey, Anthony, we, I cut off for a minute. I don't know if you did or not. Um... For about we lost you for about 20 seconds so you might okay. want to step back and just repeat and i could just chop this in the video afterwards right 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 there i was just talking about how amazing of a guy gene is <laughs> oh, darn it <laughs> okay let's go back so you probably heard this whole yeah we saw that i saw that me. part already uh-huh and you so what i was saying slide. is part of the reason yeah i'm i'm, I'm being rude like just crazy honest over here. Part of the reason we kind of stopped making that, you pointed out, is like a, a typical room's gonna need two or three of these spring traps. That's 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 like two thousand dollars worth of low frequency absorption where you could just add more subwoofers and tune them, correct? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so what we're more inclined these days in doing is sort of mid-base absorbers to control reflection decay time in the upper modal frequencies. It's just more what you need, and then put four subwoofers and tune them. And see, that's what, that, and that's why I love the stuff you do because you're embracing the latest science, and that's what we're all about. So yeah. you understand clearly the benefits of multi sub, and yeah. we use the base traps as a tool with it. Yeah. So I have bad news for you. That's not the latest science. Do you know when? Uh, do you remember when Todd Welty, if you know, presented that paper, that seminal paper about multi subs? I would think in the late, early two thousands. No, two thousand three. At yeah. AES in yeah. Europe, 2003. It's and I like, think the oh. reason why that came out was because Dr. Floyd Toole was looking for a way to get good bass in his living room, and he thought about using subwoofers as active bass traps, and I think he had, because Todd Welty worked at Harmon when Floyd worked there, right. and I think he had him study it. I think that's that's right. my understanding, is this, this all came from the idea that Floyd didn't want to put bass traps in his room. He wanted to put multiple subs. It, it, was, it was that. It was also the work that we all knew for a long time, you know, me and me and all the other guys doing room designs and installations and Todd's like, yeah, we know that by putting more subwoofers in the room, we can get better. And it was all haphazard. We'd try it here and try it there. And Todd's is like, you know, I'm going to do the MATLAB research on this. I'm going to, I'm going to yep. get into detail about to figure out what the science is behind this and came up all with all the eigenvalues. Right. So, um, so these days our, both our designs and the products we sell, which are sometimes independent, sometimes grouped, call more for what I would call mid-base absorbers. So this is an example of a thing we're, we're using and specking and selling. Uh, this thing doesn't cost that much. You're going to ask me how much, and I can't remember, but it's like, I don't, I, it's like about 100 bucks or 80 bucks or 90 I forget. Not very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but it's basically a, a chunk of a big chunk of dense polyester foam, so heavier than than the lighter foams you'll get out there, with a membrane in the front that's perforated so that it has a little bit of mid frequency absorption, um, and it's it's sixty by sixty by twenty five deep, so twenty four by twenty four by sixteen, not very big, um, and it works from sixty hertz up to five hundred hertz. Very honestly, not very effective below sixty hertz because it's just not deep enough. Mm -hmm not rigid enough, It's re and it's intentionally made to carry more of the mid base. Um, and you can get it in many different colors and styles, something, you know, to, to match your interior, that whatever like the rest cube. of your stuff is going on there. Very so, cool. So I, those I go in the showing, corners then, right? It goes in the corners. Uh, and it could be a wall, you know, wall to wall corner. It can be a, a you know, floor to floor corner up in the ceiling, wherever you can find a corner. A whole column of it on both sides can look really cool. Um, 
and I'm How only do you keep them in place. If you're stacking them, they seem like they would tip over easily. Yeah. So, so you can, you can get this really cool magnetic, uh, 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 installation kit with these things where you actually glue these four little neodymium magnets into the foam and you put a, a big fender washer into the wall and it goes click. Nice. Um, or if you want to get lazy and you say, I'm not going to be moving this thing. There's this thing called a hot, hot glue gun. You remember those, those, like you buy those yep. at the project store, a little bit of hot glue on the back of the foam into the wall pff, and it holds. Um, if you're very Rube Goldberg, Rube Goldberg about it, you can drive a little screw right here. Whoops. Um, and a little screw right there and it'll you know, sort of work. Okay. So, um, and I'm only showing a few finishes over here. And there's so a quick, quick question I have for you on that. If you have a sub in a corner, can you just put that like right above the sub from yeah. the sub all the way to the ceiling? Yeah. Yeah. And people are going to go, you're going to absorb this up. It's like, yeah. The standing waves just propagate after one bounce. They propagate. It's like it doesn't matter. It's not. Yeah. It's not like a ray of sound that that just goes back and forth. Um, so, um, anyway, we've got a bunch of different colors, and then we have this thing for up higher frequencies, which is not tympanic. It's just a big chunk of foam, and like I said, it relies on friction. It's not going to work very well at lower frequencies. Um, if you if you know you have a problem in the mid bass, you can use this. It's a lot cheaper, but there's a lot of people who sell things just like this and call them bass traps. I would never want to call this a bass trap. That's completely unfair. It's a lie. It's an abusive language. Don't don't think this is going to control your subwoofer frequencies. Uh, mm -hmm. And this being a bit again a big chunk of foam or fiberglass stuck in the corner, it just it just won't get there. Okay. So um, RPG, the venerable company, I always give them a hats off. You notice I'm always mentioning them. Why? Because yeah. one, they were started by a guy who has a doctorate in astrophysics and something else. So Peter D'Antonio, hello, Peter, if you're listening, or the guys who work there, extremely smart guy, very, very sharp. Um, and he's come up with all kinds of amazing products over the years. There's a product they make called the Modex, which is a corner mounted thing that's about the same size as this, by the way. Um, and uh, But it's a really different topology. It works, uh, it works at as opposed to being a sort of a broadband base absorber, it is a resonator. You have to know what frequencies you're working for or working against. And you can buy it as a 40 hertz box, a 60 hertz box, or a 63 hertz box, or an 80 hertz box. Those happen to be third octave frequencies, if those of you uh, geeks out there know what the ISO frequencies are. And the process of its operation looks something like this. The um, uh, acoustic pressure uh, f causes flexure in a membrane in the front that's actually a rubber membrane that's made to ring at the frequency that you bought the thing for. That excites the volume of air inside. There's a big chunk of frictional absorption and the energy dissipates inside. Um, and, and there again, that's how it looks. There, there is data from RPG on its response character. You can see that it absorbs you know, the, uh, I think this was the 80 hertz one. It absorbs really nicely at, at 80 hertz. This particular data is related back to absorption coefficient, which is a really different way that I'm looking at it for the standing wave thing. But it tells you this thing works. Um, know that rooms don't ever have a, a standing wave resonance at one frequency. Mm -hmm. They usually have two or three or more standing wave resonances. And, oh, unless you're building this cube room where where they're, they're, well, even then there's three frequencies that like 30, 60, and 90, for example, or 40, 80, and 120. Um, so if you're gonna use Modex or any other very frequency selective tympanic devices, you're gonna have to plan on using them at a few different frequencies to cover your range of what's gonna happen in the room. Okay, um, Gene? It's an hour and 10 minutes into this business about yeah. <laughs> uh, about base traps. I'm having a good time. Um, any questions? Any thoughts? Um, you know, I think it's probably a decent place to stop. Uh, it just gave me a bunch of ideas of follow-ups to doing this. I think we should do one on subwoofer positioning and, you know, seat positioning. Even though I've covered those uh, topics before in the channel, it's always great to get someone else's perspective on that from someone. Because you've set up, what, maybe a thousand rooms in your lifetime or close to it? We've we've now designed, so since I started my company 22 years ago, we've, we've designed and, you know, carried through construction a thousand projects. And before that, for 10 years at THX, I worked on a ton of rooms. And before that at Dolby, I worked on a lot of rooms, but it was the work at Dolby that led me into like going, whoa, the room acoustics is really messing me up. And at the time, I didn't really know very much about room acoustics, so, um, or, or not at all. Um, 
And in, in those times, I observed things were not working like I wanted to, but I had no idea what I was doing at that time. I yeah. was young, young and stupid. So it's always good to get someone that's had, that has a lot of field experience because let's face it, uh, we have formulas on where to put subwoofers in a room, but almost yeah. it's never practical most of the time. People don't have ideally shaped rooms. So it's good to kind of talk about this stuff and give some guidelines, but uh, evident, you know, ultimately, people need to learn how to do measurements with a microphone using mm -hmm. REW. And that's another one we could cover. We could talk about what you do with art. Cause I'm, you use REW, I assume, right? I have in my warehouse, I have two shelves full of, of audio analysis equipment that I've spent maybe a hundred thousand dollars on over the last 20 years. And now I'm down to, to using REW that runs beautifully unbelievable work. You guys over there, yep. uh, Thank you so much. I regularly contribute money, and all of you guys using REW, please send a little bit of pocket change to to uh, Macaulay on a regular basis. Um, and uh, it's great. I, I use my good microphones and a good multiplexer and stuff like that. But yeah, you can do a ton of stuff with that that uh, program. Yeah, I've retired my LMS system. I've retired yeah. my Sen I had the Sencore 495. I don't know if you remember yeah. that thing. I, I the, remember that. I, I got one on the store now. <laughs> yeah, not one on the show. It's like I, I can't get myself to, to throw it out or you know have because it. it's be it's beautiful hardware. But what do you do with it at this point? Yeah. It's vintage. You show it to people and you go. I, I used to have to work with this. You know, yeah. at the time we had to walk to school barefoot in the snow. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's a lot of branch offs from this video itself. We covered pretty much all the different types of bass traps, as far as I'm concerned, right? Did you touch them all, or did you have all the ones you wanted to talk uh, about? No, those are, the, those are the main things I wanted to cover. We, we could go on and on and on and on. Um, and uh, But but that's that kind of gives a, a flavor uh, for the you know the main things to, to look at. Um, people have actually have come back to me and said, hey, you know, can I have your links to where, where to reach you? Um, if you wouldn't mind putting that back up with our picture on the side, uh, let's see here. Um, dee -dee 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 -dee. There's, there's my, my, uh, website. Oh, you had it. Address. Feel free Good. to email, email me. Hey, some of you guys that are listening ha have been pinging me and I'm, I'm putting you in the queue to respond. You, you've gotten either phone calls back or emails back. It's like, okay, we're, we're, we're putting this into the schedule. We are. We are pretty busy. Um, I wish I could just sit around by the phone and talk about the stuff, but I, I've got work to do for lots of different clients. So you're not being ignored. Uh, we're, we're sending out questionnaires to understand a little bit more about what you're doing and what you're interested in. And then at some point we'll schedule the time to, to talk. Uh, meanwhile, you can look at these uh, websites, the one for the acoustical materials, the one for the speakers that we're, we're working on right now. And then the, uh, the engineering company that uh, occupies us a lot. Um, so, that's information you can go look at. Um, all right. Yeah, and I'll put these links down below in the description. Thank and you. I have I have a whole playlist that's called Room Acoustics on our channel that has all these live streams that we've done. I think this is like the fourth or fifth one that we've done so far. Yeah. So we're being pretty regular about it. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, every, every Thursday, here I am. I love this. Gene, I lost you. I can see the live uh, countdown number still going. So um, if any of you guys are still listening or if I, if we're still on, we're going to wait for Gene to join us. It's a wonderful thing about these webinars. It's, it's uh, amazing. If anybody can actually explain to me how a, a big bandwidth of, uh, of internet connection and a decent computer and all of that still interrupts halfway through uh, and how do you get around that, I'd love to know. So my, my, my internet <laughs> dropped again. I am, I'm, in, I'm supposedly in a neighborhood that has state of the art, 400 meg up and down service, connected city. And every night I get these in and outs and I called spectrum, by the way, if anybody has spectrum, I really want to freaking pound them. They <laughs> from fiber right to my control panel. And yeah. they can't do anything about me losing service like yeah. this. I, um, Gene, I was actually, I think I was still on and talking to people about, hey, this happens all the time. So I have Comcast over here and AT&T, which, which is, you know, the telephone company and the cable company. They both have the same thing, which is you'll be in the middle of something. And you know, yeah, and it, does, and it doesn't matter if you have $10,000 worth of Luxel gear. Nope. It's only as good as the connection coming to your house. Right. Now, you're, <laughs> you're lucky when you get interrupted, you're not in the middle of a. 
<laughs> like, you don't have one of those. Funny, I usually like block right where I'm making a funny face. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to wrap this up before I lose my internet. This is the third time I've lost it on the stream. Luckily, you've been talking all those other times and people didn't notice. Yeah. But um, yeah, I appreciate you, Anthony, dropping this knowledge here. And guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We have that slide presentation there. And yeah. we're going to be covering more topics on acoustics. We're doing this every Thursday at 11 p.m. Eastern. I, uh, I pull Anthony from his work so he could do this stuff because I think this is really important to educate. I really appreciate that. And let us know in the comments down below what you guys want to see covered, whether it's room acoustics or just speaker setup, anything that, you, that would help you enhance your home theater experience. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit that bell notification so you know when these videos drop. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. We're going to do it. So, Gene, real quick, next next week, I'm oh, planning. Oh, I dropped it. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Well, so what I'm planning to do next week is the, is the next part of